first of all, we want to welcome everybody. We're going to move very much on to topics and subjects to take a look at what's going on. David has to leave in around 40 minutes, and I'd like to capture as much as he can provide us as well, so I may lean to him more than others. But let's take with the first question. How should the trade handle Russian source diamonds, David? What's your view? And I'm, when I'm talking about Russian source, I'm talking about diamonds from El Rosa that are cut outside of Russia, and therefore they are substantially transformed. So if you've got a view on that, David, I'd like to hear it. I do. Is this on? Okay. Yeah, it's speak nicely. Okay, well, well, thank you. And um, I'm sure my view is not exclusive. I'm sure there's other people uh, here today and on, on the uh, Zoom call that have the same perspective. Um, and that is that, uh, and I'll talk a little bit from a RJC and Signet perspective. Uh, and when any company, because that's your question, what should companies do, right? Or how should the trade? The trade is companies. The trade is not government, right? The trade is companies. And we believe, RJC and Signet, that all companies ought to be doing uh, what we call OECD due diligence guidance, okay? which is specifically uh, incorporates risks around human rights abuses, okay? And that's what we did as Signet. When that war started on February 24th last year, we took our philosophy, which other companies and other organizations have or ought to have, and applied the five-step DDG against that and determined that this is a human rights risk in our supply chain that we don't want anymore. So we had a relationship with Al Rosa, uh, direct relationship, we ended that. We also then went to our suppliers and we said, we have a, we've now put a full company ban on Russian goods and then work with them as we still do on implementing that ban, okay? Now what we do is, as a company is what I believe all retailers ought to be doing around the world all companies ought to be doing around the world. And if you apply the OECD due diligence guidance, it's an easy answer. What's obviously going on there is human rights violations on an extraordinary scale, on a horrific scale. And uh, if, if a company looks at uh, their supply chain and has human rights abuses in, as a risk, which was what the OECD calls for, among other things, then it's an easy solution as to what to do, and that would be not to carry Russian diamonds. Is that? Is that well, yeah, let's take it up a level. Should the RJC allow its members to trade Russian source diamonds? Because we're looking at your values as a company, Signet, for example, or Rapport, or any value, and that's great. And I think there's a message here. Every company has to decide for themselves their level of ethics if it's beyond the law. And ethics is very relativistic to morality, to who you are, and what you want to, if you're a Chinese company, you might want to buy Russian diamonds. You want to support Al Rosa. You know, you might feel that way. So I can't say what the standards should be for each company. But then we start putting these umbrellas to protect us from the evil reign, so to speak. And the RJC is probably the number one maybe the only really standard setting organization. Mm -hmm. Now, what do we do when there's different standards? So for example, I'll just go back to the simple question. Sure. Can RJC members, or should RJC members, that's a funny phrase, can or should, trade Russian source diamonds? What's your view as the RJC? The fact is, if you're an RJC member, you've signed up for OECD due diligence. The RJC is built on fundamentally its standards are built around OECD due diligence guidance and our members are, are, signed, are signed up for that and they're audited against that to be sort of certified members. So if you're an RJC member and, and you're applying OECD to your uh, supply chain, to your company, then again, there's a decision about uh, uh, how, you how you should go further, but uh, go forward. But as you said, the RJC is a standards organization. It's not the police, it's not the UN, it's not uh, an organization that uh, has the ability to tell countries or companies what to do. It can, it, it, it advises companies to follow the laws of the land. So in the US, with this band that we have, 
yeah, for all the members in the U.S., we're helping them achieve the goal of the U.S. government, which is to ban all Russian diamonds in the U.S. And that's, that's the extent of it. As far as England has a ban on uh, Russian banks and other, other countries have uh, similar initiatives like that. But nobody's gone as far as the U.S. in terms of a, a, a full ban on the people, the company, and the product. That's a first ever, regardless of the transformation. But are OECD standards debatable in the sense that some people say Russian source diamonds are okay according to OECD standards, and other people might say, well, Russian diamonds aren't. And so we're looking, and the reason I brought a specific example is because, hey, you know, if OECD guidelines are clear that Russian diamonds cannot be traded and all Signet members, um, not Signet members, but all RJC members say, okay, we are not, we are complying with this, then really, then RJC members should not be trading Russian diamonds. That's and if the they are, they should be thrown out, obviously. Well, if those companies, it's their decision, okay, and they should be applying OECD due diligence guidance, okay, but it's not the RJC's place to tell them. So can what, RJC reject someone if they do something? To, I'm sorry. Can sorry. you throw someone out for trading uh, sanctioned diamonds or In the US, violating if, if, OECD if rules? If you're a U.S. member, yes, correct. If you're a U.S., because there yes. we have the law. Correct. So basically what we're saying is that RJC settles down on the law. Correct, the law of the Gives language. advisories. But unless you violate the law, you're not going to get thrown out of the RJC. You have to, yeah, you have to violate uh, our... Law, not morality or ethics correct. or something like you know, that. Our, our, okay, our, that's a reasonable yeah. point. Which then takes us to an industry where we have things going on, and I don't know who else is on the other thing, but let's throw this around a little bit. Um, we have an industry where we have different standards. Some people in the United States has one law. Dubai has another law. Mm -hmm. And now what we need to do is figure out how are we going to allow these communications about these obviously different standards. I don't buy Russian uh, source. I do. We're both RJC members. So RJC doesn't address the issue of Russian source, of, for example, a retailer. Are there any retailers here who's close to retailers? I'm guys? a retail Martin. Okay, can, I where? Ask, can I actually ask? Yeah, I, I need you. So, yeah. So, what if you wanted to say, I don't want to deal with Russian standards, and then you guys, oh, you guys, I'm RJC member, so everything's well, actually, okay. Can I ask, why are we asking the RJC to determine whether or not the variety of um, manufacturers, retailers who are certified by the RJC to determine whether or not they sell Russian? Why aren't we asking the KP to do this? Well, I mean, the they are, but they are effectively now conflict diamonds. So well, no, 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 no. There's a big problem with conflict diamonds with I the know definition, that. Uh, and also with that the, the KP... narrow definition of conflict diamonds, they are not conflict diamonds. Right. But with the with the broad definition of what most people think a conflict diamond is, right. they are now funding conflict with diamonds. Yeah, but but that doesn't so why deal are we with the but, the R, but but the KP doesn't make that decision at all. It's Hornbook rule. They are not going to make a decision about human rights at this stage because it's not part of their definition. So we could ask the, I don't know the. The, the waiters association of, of, of the hotel here and ask them because the KP has absolutely no relevance as to anything that goes beyond their scope right now. If they would change, you know, they may change. So okay. and the reason, let me just answer that. The reason we, we go to the RJC is very specific. Well, they're an industry organization, but over a number of different types of companies functioning under different laws. So as a U.S. retailer, we, at this time, we never had a relate, direct relationship with Al Rosa, so we don't, we didn't have to cut ties, but we did delist our Russian origin stones as a brand, but that's because of our ethos. For we all know up and coming US EU sanctions will uh, pressure everyone else to stop selling, to, to do the due diligence to ensure that they're not selling Russian origin rough. But this, this seems like a very large ask of the RJC since they have Indian manufacturer site holders of certified retailer brands all over Europe and the US. And Indian manufacturers are, aside from fan financing, nobody, they don't have sanctions that are telling them not to deal in Russia. Right. Yeah, we we're fully aware of that. Look, that makes the point here. Governments have certain standards that are relevant to their national strategic interests. The diamond industry isn't even a ping pong ball in their ocean, but it makes noise. We're in a situation right now where numerous standards are developing across the diamond world. Some people will deal in Russian diamonds, and some people won't. We have the United States market, which 
50% at least, maybe even two thirds of diamond jewelry sales go through here, although signets like 50% of what they sell is, is engagement rings. And now we're thinking, what do we do for these retailers in the United States? They want to buy something that they know is okay. They're very different than retailers in India, certainly different than retailers in China, or Russia for them. So we are now in a world where people are saying all kinds of things, and it's driving a, a stake, it's hurting any effort to be socially responsible because there's no level playing field. So if I'm selling goods in the United States and say I'm not gonna handle Russian goods, and someone else has Russian goods, Russian source goods, and I'm not using the origin thing, that's a whole other story, because that is in fact illegal, I'm at, a dis I'm at a distinct disadvantage. And if I can't tell people my goods are better than those goods, and how do I tell it to them? And what standards can we use? So I'll just tell you, you know, my goods are not Russian because it has the KP certificate. You know, I'll tell that to consumers and it's a lie because the KP will certify Russian. And I'm not even being judgmental here. I don't mind. You know, I can understand people that say, I need to sell Russian source diamonds. I just need to do it to feed my children. And he's in Surat, India. I'm not, you know, hey. But we, if we're looking at this whole issue of the diamond and jewelry industry and the energy coming from the consumers, and we're trying to address that honestly, not necessarily for or against Russia, just honestly, how do we set those standards? What do we do? Can, can I just come back to- Please, yeah. Just to close this, this off. It's, yeah. not a, it's not a one, uh, there's not one step that does it. It's not the KP. Okay, it's not the RJC. It's we call it a four-step process. Okay, and they're all OECD based. All right, so we have the Kimberly process. Then we have the RJC, which is a standards organization, right? And it's talking about the company's business practices. That's what it's about, right? Then companies like ourselves created, also based on OECD, the Signet Responsible Sourcing Protocol. Now that's very specific, and it's very specific to product. Okay and that is open source for any U.S. company, any company in the world. And the website's called signetresponsiblesourcing.com and the SRSP is there and all of our, 100% of our suppliers comply to that SRSP and they're audited against it, okay? And that's where our Russian ban is. So if U.S. retailers, U.S. companies want to know how to do it, this is how you do it. And if you start asking the questions in the survey that's in the SRSP and you start getting answers you don't like or non-answers, that ought to be a, that's how the OECD due diligence works. That's like a red flag. Red flag means time to hang up the phone. Can smaller jewelers, sure. independent yes. jewelers use this yeah. SR? This if I had, yes, if I had, a, if, I, if I had a store, okay, and I went on there, it's basic enough, okay, to explain the kinds of questions to ask. And, Suppliers, most of them that are here, and certainly RJC certified members, know how to answer those questions. They're equipped to answer those questions. Okay, so there is a method. Yes. Mm -hmm. There is something that people can do. And I think we need to take that effort here to educate people and say, hey, these are steps that you can take to improve your social responsibility mm -hmm. views. I don't know if they're sufficient, I haven't gone through the SRSP, but I think that it's very important for us to recognize. But let me ask you this, Jenna. You've been studying this whole thing with us, I've worked for what, almost a half a year, or even a year. Is it a violation of OECD standards to sell Russian source diamonds? And I'm talking about diamonds cut out of Russia. What standards? Did you OECD. Mean? They don't have standards. It's we, a guidance. Ah, yeah, so let's guidance. understand that. The so OECD, OECD is, is there, what are they, guidelines? Yes. They're guidelines for companies to follow. It's up to the company, not countries. Okay, or, so if yeah, I'm a yeah. U.S. jeweler, yes. I want to buy diamonds today that are not being sourced in Russia. Mm -hmm. What do I do? You go to, who do I go to? You go to RJC certified members, and that's who you work And you're with. saying RJC certified members do, will well, not or should not deal in Russian diamonds. They should be able to meet that request. Uh, so they might deal with it, but, they'll, but you ask them and they'll say, I can give you diamonds that are right. not from Russia. Sources. Correct. So now it's very interesting. We're talking about a world that has different standards, and we're even talking about companies that might be applying different standards to different streams of their goods. So everything's getting along. We're not kicking Because it's anywhere. based on the law of the land. Yeah. yeah. What, what's your view on this, Harris? Martin, I think we are 
in an extreme difficult situation geopolitically, and it's not an easy uh, situation. I think we all agree on that. First of all, I want to reiterate that the OEC due diligence is the best instrument to guide companies in the journey of learning more about their supply chain. I think we agree the more we know about our supply chain, the more transparent we will be, and the more we know exactly what is happening in that supply chain. So it's a great instrument. The second instrument that I would like to reference is the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. We should not forget that. It is the instrument on the human rights agenda that really looks at how companies indirectly impact conflict. And it becomes a very challenging situation with the Russian diamonds. My point of view is that companies, CEOs, have to decide their vision. And they have to, first of all, of course, comply, like David says, with the law and the regulations. And there it becomes difficult because it's very different in different parts of the world. So that's then a, a really value-driven decision. But I think once you've made that decision, first of all, to respect the law, of course, but second, to buy or not to buy Russian diamonds, you need to be honest and transparent to your consumer, to society, to all your stakeholders. And when you segregate those diamonds, you need to be very clear on it. And I think that's where it becomes challenging if companies will start telling, into, we are bringing in diamonds into the supply chain that are actually Russian diamonds, potentially not allowed in certain countries, in certain countries allowed, so depending it's a breach of law. There we are breaching the trust of the industry and will hit on the full industry. And that's why I go back, it's, it is a, it's a process of continuous improvement we need to understand better supply chains and we need to respect the due diligence of the OECD, but also the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. And at the end of the day, it's about integrity and authenticity. So it's up to that CEO to, if you're still allowed in a certain country to buy Russian diamonds, to say, no, it is a very conscious decision that I am not doing that. But again, you know, we can't, it's, it's a person, it's often a personal decision then, a value driven decision. So we're saying that a consumer has to believe what the retailer is telling them um, about where the diamonds come from um, and prove positive, you know, may or may not exist. And that's a good point to go to David and say, okay, um, this idea that we can show where the provenance of a rough diamond or maybe polished diamond comes from. There's technology moving on this, right? This is not, we're not in a world that isn't dynamic. So do we have technology that can resolve that issue so that a, a retailer can provide proof? Okay, and I'm not talking about decorative statement plus auditing, mm -hmm. which might be something that Iris that OECD talks about. Um, but can we, what's our level of knowledge about where, so a retailer says, I don't want to sell Russian. I, I know. Yeah, I want to know where this diamond comes from. Is that possible today? What's your view on that? Yeah. So, so technology-wise, it's possible. Uh, but I think we all need to remember that the technology is just a means to an end. Um, it's not the not the objective. Um, but today, definitely, technology exists. There are multiple different technologies available today that enable, I would say, increasing the transparency. Uh, it's not necessary. Um, it increases the level of transparency throughout the pipeline. It increases the level of assurance that that consumer or retailer can get. Um, so you can move from declarations which are good to uh, verifiable data, which is even better. And I think, again, it's a decision that how sure you want to be, how much assurance you want to provide for your client. It's, a, it's an independent decision by each company. Um, but yes, the technology exists uh, today, and it uh, exists on scale. So uh, the fear of saying, OK, do we do only part of our um, goods, um, that's a problem because I can't prove everything. And I think uh, my answer to that is everyone just needs to take their first step. You don't need to do everything, but do something. Uh, take that first step, um, and, and from there you can go from there. So, so. so that's very good advice. We can't solve the whole problem immediately, but we can go after it. We can try to develop it. I'm still concerned about the level playing field problem. I'm still concerned about greenwashing, but let me go, Leanne, do you agree that there are blockchain solutions 
that can absolutely give us a high level of confidence. And what do we do with the garbage in, garbage out aspect of the blockchain? I could put in information, but how do I know that the information is correct when it comes to maybe sourcing? But maybe you have some experiences there you can share Look, with us. Look, there's various um, spectrums of detail as it relates to mapping a supply chain and tracing a supply chain. Um, clearly, there is a, a, a symphony of technologies that need to reside together to be able to not only identify a diamond, but also its trace elements. There was a great conversation yesterday with GIA proving or disproving certain elements of science as to whether we could enable a fingerprinting of a diamond from a specific kimberlite um, source geographically, which is a very difficult process to do. Mm -hmm. But let's not forget, this isn't just about following the diamond. Arguably, we've got to follow the money. And so the coupling of that physicality of the supply chain, the banking system and the exchange of value, at some point in time, there's a bag of cash being exchanged, right, for trade. So what are we doing about following the money, not just only following the diamond? I think that's a very strong point. I brought it up this morning also in the, in the talk. If you think about the recent um, disclosures by the uh, uh, Treasury Department that uh, the diamond dealers are trading with Hezbollah and funding Hezbollah, and we've been talking, I ah, can't be, it's crazy, and maybe it is crazy, but um, this idea of following the money is tremendously important because even if you know that the diamond is from a good, let's say we, I accept the beers as a responsible source of product. We can talk about that and argue about it, but I'm going to accept them, okay? The BPP and how they do it and everything. If a diamond comes from a De Beers mine, I'm saying it's a kosher diamond. Okay? But what are we going to do about these situations where you don't know? You know, first of all, you don't know necessarily where the diamond came from. Do you know in your blockchain? That you, are you secure that this rough diamond came from this mine? There's no scientific method that is proven and adopted across any part of the industry that enables the trace elements of a natural stone to know its origin and source. Now, there are some exceptional stones, for example, the Argyll mine in Australia and even some yellows in Russia that potentially could have trace elements where we can with some scientific certainty, give a best estimation. And that is out of the words of the scientists of industry of GIA. So therefore, we are, have to be reliant upon the attribution of other data points and triangulate those together to be able to make an assertion um, of good judgment. Uh, this is not a technology of blockchain or not problem to solve. Um, this ultimately will be solved with the evolution of science, and science is not evolved to the point where we can change the way upon which a diamond is formed. I mean, that, that baseline science does not have, if AI or not AI, we still okay. don't have it. So we have to triangulate okay. the best practices of trades, align with standards, bring ourselves into that good people doing good business. Um, so, that's so, fine. so let's look at this issue of the chain of custody a bit. If we're going to say that there are certain diamonds that are different from other diamonds because we know something about their source, and you can say, listen, you can't do anything, sorry. Diamonds and source and origination, we have no idea. We have to accept the Russian diamonds, Zimbabwe diamonds. Diamonds are diamonds. Diamonds have no trace, so to speak. But now we're trying through various systems, and we should talk about that a little bit here, which is with metal. Through various systems, we're trying to monitor or sort of observe the flow of the product. And you know, I've been eating kosher food. Jews have been eating kosher food for thousands of years. Somehow we're able to eat kosher food. Um, you've got the forestry people doing things with timber. You've got the fisheries people doing things with fish. So we have to find ways to trace that flow. And I would imagine that would be there. But again, how do I answer a retailer who says, I'd like to know that I'm not buying Russian diamonds? And you're saying, tell them it's an RJC member and then you can sleep and you don't have to worry about it? No, I'm saying go to RJC and members, conduct your own due diligence following ah. OECD, DDG, learn about it at signetresponsiblesourcing.com. I'll go one step further. Last year, we, for the first time ever in our sustainability report, published the names of our top 20 jewelry, uh, jewelry manufacturers. Okay? 
that report's coming out Wednesday, and now it's going to have 40. That's great. So, yeah. so we're Good. trying to convey uh, uh, companies that are RJC members, certified RJC members, and that are following the Signet SRSP, for example, which includes a ban on Russian diamonds. So I want is, to- Is the Signet, is it that just this company, when you see a company is okay, right? I'm a little jeweler here. I read your report. I said, okay, I can buy from this company. Or is that company only doing special things for, for Signet no, no, to do you, it? Or is it on the company? Is it on the things you're buying? So, it's not one step. It's not KP alone. It's not RJC alone. It is not uh, SRSP alone. It's the combination of all of them. Okay, you have to do all of them. And that's what OECD due diligence guidance tells you. Make sure you have management systems. That's what the RJC is about. Make sure you uh, understand uh, you know, who your customer, know your customer, all those kinds of things. Okay? And you feel that the independent jeweler can do this? Anybody can do the OECD five-step mm -hmm. program. Let's, let's but hear from you. Well, last thing I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah, okay? yeah. And I, I, I hope, I hope, uh, I hope this really comes through. And maybe you're asking rhetorically about this thing about every diamond. Okay, I think that's something that we have to change our thinking about. In Signet, we talk about companies. We don't talk about diamonds. We talk about companies. And the paper trails are with companies, not with diamonds. And as you know better than me, every diamond's in a parcel, every diamond is accounted for, every diamond's got an invoice, and that's how we audit against a paper and in companies. It isn't about the diamond tracking a diamond. It is about working with suppliers that meet OECD due diligence guidance and answering the kinds of questions you as an as a, as a independent family jeweler in the U.S. Okay, can ask. And then how do I, and if I don't get the right answers, where do I go? Okay, you can go to the RJC, and there's other organizations, but the RJC is the only ICL accredited, independent, third party organization in the world for our category with standards, okay? You can have your own OEC due diligence program. We have Signet Responsible Sourcing Program. JA has a diamond source warranty. Tiffany has its own too. The diamond source warranty and Signets are the only open source one. They're free to everybody to use. So that's how you do it by company. That's how you, it's not by diamond, you do it by company. Now that's, that's a very high overview, but that's to answer your question. That's how you address the diamonds is by the company that you keep. Yeah, but we're talking about in the case well, of Russian. We're, in the case of Russian, we're talking about the diamond. We're not yeah, talking yeah, about I just the company. Want, so I don't know, wait, wait, wait. wait. There's, there's a question so about the company oh. that buys the oh, diamonds from Al Rosa. And there's questions there about beneficial owners, and there's questions about oligarchs. So we can't avoid the issue of the company when we're mm -hmm. talking about the issue of the product. So in the end, sure. it's some kind of a combination. But please go but ahead. I think, I think, I think ultimately, speak to the mic even closer. Oh, okay. But you can move think, the mic. I, move I think, that mic. Move that mic over. Yeah, there you go. I think ultimately it's a really big ask for small retailers to say that they, they do OEC due diligence guidelines. I mean, obviously it's a great start to look at RGC members, to look at Signet's uh, preferred manufacturers, but without Signet's buying power, the chances that that manufacturer is definitely giving you non-Russian, even if you've requested, is pretty slim. Um, because Indian manufacturers are, are under a lot of pressure, right, to continue that flow. Um, I do think that we need to spread responsibility across the supply chain. I'm not saying all diamonds can be on the blockchain by any means, but I'm saying there are definitely a subset that can. And if we if we parse out the responsibility, some to the mine, via the KP, through the rough traders, into the manufacturers, over to the polished wholesalers, or directly to the retail via the blockchain, then that ultimate U.S. retailer has some sort of proof to show that they they, they've done, everybody has done um, their part to prove that single stone. Not all stones by any means. I just, I just don't think it's feasible for, for small retailers. I know what we do is, is, is very profound and thorough and it's, it takes a team and it's just not possible for a, a small retailer to do. Can I also just add that a small re retailer, I think it's really important to say, again, this buying power. They don't, they can't necessarily buy directly from an RJC member either. They're generally going into the market and saying, where can I get the best deal for my customer who wants to pay X price? So we can't ignore that that's a reality that an independent especially is facing every day. Well, it's hard for me to sit here and you're saying something that I don't believe is true and you're saying something that I don't believe is true. If I open up a store tomorrow, this is the first thing I'm going to be doing is going to RJC certifi certified members. That's the so, world and you I, live and in. I'm going to be doing 40,000 jewelers in America guidance. that are trying to figure out Nobody how to empty the toilet. Nobody can stop me from doing that. 
Yeah, wait, 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 wait. wait. Okay. Everybody's got an angle. Hang on before I go to you. Um, but there's something interesting going on here, and that's the idea. I'm kosher, right? I don't know all the rabbis. I don't know what. And I just want to have a nice little kosher can of corn. I got a Heinz, baked beans. I got a Heinz. I got a restaurant. And I said, oh, you. It's a Hallmark. And I know if it's got the OU Hallmark, I can buy those things. By the way, Heinz makes pork and beans. It's next shelf, same Heinz, okay? But Heinz has got this little OU on it for the vegetarian beans, and I'm happy doing that. And so I'm starting to think along the lines of maybe whether we need a Hallmark or something that makes it easy for jewelers. And that takes me back to the standard discussion of, you know, if you've got this mark, I'm, what do we do? We did a Rappaport Green Star, which is very extreme. It's only diamonds from Okavango that go direct to the GIA to get a DOR. So we have 800 diamonds out of 1.8 million on Rappaport, but that's fine because we don't need to solve the whole world's problems right away. It's this process. But I'll go to Uris and I'll say, what about a Hallmark? Well, you know, People can't do their own due diligence every they, time. They really can. What? Yes, they can. Oh, I don't know why you're, you're saying that they can't the when they can. Let me, let me hear from you, then we'll come back to you on one other issue. Okay. Public. Okay. 94 percent of RJC uh, yeah. comes from small members. Okay. okay. It is not a big only. So you're thing. saying join and, RJC. Yes. And that's, that's fine. That's and, and that's And, you're okay. from, and, and small that's companies good. are doing it. We got and that. We got that. So, no, so this, we, this idea that you can't do it, I don't know where that's coming from. Yeah, I, I'm telling you that it's, for most smaller jewelers, there's a different view out there. Mm -hmm. And the view is that they are just struggling to survive, I don't and know, they cannot can, make ethical decisions. Maybe you can put up the five-step OECD due diligence what? guideline. Maybe you can put up the five-step OECD due diligence guidelines so that everybody can see what we're talking about. We can do that. I don't know if I'm going to do it fundamental right now, questions. But, okay, so look. I think what we need to do over here is to, and I guess Ari's about there, and we got uh, our, our team sitting back there. I want us to come up with something that promotes very strongly to the entire jewelry community the concept of these five steps that we believe will solve it. Let's go through them ourselves and see. And I think that we should encourage everybody to be as involved with kosher diamonds or with uh, our, you know, those kinds of diamonds. It's fine, and we'll do that. And to the degree that what you say gets traction, it wins. But what about those other jewelers, okay? And there probably are a few here and there that are, they need a hallmark, but go ahead, Iris, you were gonna say something. Well, I was there when the RGC was founded in 2005. I think everyone knows I deeply care about uh, RGC and the standards. I was there when Signet started with their protocol. What it has done, it has brought management systems into the industry. If we would have not had it, we would have not evolved. But the reality is, and I think, David, I have a little bit of a nuanced vision on it, is that the past eight months, I did my own stakeholder engagement with many supplier communities, also of the brands. And I think, in general, smaller enterprises need more care, need more guidance, need more education, and need simple tools to integrate some of these practices and guidance, for example, like the OEC due diligence, also UN guiding principles. They don't have lawyers, they don't have legal counsel, they need help. So that's one thing. In my view, if you want to have a robust system, and you talk really about sustainability, you need both. You need standards, implemented, certified, credible. But second, also you need to look at the product, where it's coming from. We cannot hide away now that the world has changed and that consumers want to understand more where the product is coming from, how it was made. And especially now in today's world, it's not only just going to be about Russia, it's going to be about other issues too. So it means this traceability and transparency needs to be a priority. So it goes to product. Then we look at chain of custody, you know, a chain of custody. And we know, David, I mean, it has worked for the gold. We need to look at that, but it needs to be a credible system with the right methodology, with the right supporting evidence. But I think the time is right for the industry to get real on this, because I don't know why sometimes people think this is not happening. And this is aside from the Russian issue. We need more transparency. We need more traceability. The consumer cares, millennials and jet set care. And I think it's a great opportunity to take this situation to push that agenda on transparency. How can we make it happen? I mean, David, your point is every retailer, big, larger, and they should go and they should decide. OECD is not exclusive to the jewelry industry. It's for any sector. 
Right. Okay. So but maybe to general. You mentioned I, I just asked you. Yeah. How do I make sure I buy diamonds? Let's say your Lowe's. Jewelry store. Let's say your Home Depot. What? Okay. Let's say your Lowe's or your Home Depot. Right. Okay. That's why they have SS, F, FSC certified okay. wood, right? And if so you're, then FSC if you're Walmart, certified you have like MSC certified. Could right? we get a hallmark for the diamond and jewelry industry? That's up to the diamond and jewelry industry. And what does that cover? Is that you just a hallmark that they're not Russian diamonds? I think it's like what kosher. I, I think tax? it's like kosher. Then there's different levels of kosher, believe it or not. So I think we have to face the fact that there is no one standard that's going to work in the world today. Mm -hmm. that's, and there's not even one legal standard. So we have to face that fact. Four steps. Okay. So you say there's four steps to defining your standard. Four steps. Okay. For, for us, Kimberly Process, World Diamond Council, yeah. RJC, SRSP. Takes all those four th things. So we you're call saying, it. okay, yeah. so for me to want to buy something, I have mm -hmm. to make sure that I have the Kimberly Process. Mm -hmm. I have what else? The system of warranties. System of yeah. warranties, yeah. which you're putting forward, yeah. Okay, then you becoming a certified RJC member means you've got the management systems in place. So you have a certified RJC member, okay. and then what and else? And then SRSP is for the product, Signet Responsible Sourcing. Okay, and so you think of independent retail jeweler who sells a million dollars a year of goods, or Here's what maybe they can do. two million is going to sit down and read the OECD standards? Or? Here's what they can do. Yes, they what? can look at the RJC. They don't. It's open source. You don't okay, have okay, to be okay, an, okay. an RJC. So the member. RJC says we have that, a solution, but yeah. the RJC doesn't go into the moral ethical issues of no. can you? You're saying it's clear to you by OECD standards that you're not allowed to trade Russian source documents. I'm using that as an example. You could bring up something tomorrow and say, well, it's clear that we shouldn't have child labor. We shouldn't have a bunch of things. I'm not agnostic to that. So what I'm saying, I don't know. I'm a retailer, what do I do? You're saying to me, just deal with an RJC member or yeah. take your four steps. Okay, we got that. And did you feel that everybody could qualify? See, one of the differences yes. that I've been having anybody also, can read these things and decide on their own, the just like you said this morning, Martin, you said about your own person yeah. and your mother. Yeah. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, whether you're, it's a person or a company or a CEO, like Eris said, it's up to those people to take responsibility. Nobody's gonna do it for them. They have to do it themselves. And you can read what you want about the Kimberly process, agree with all of it or none of it. You can read the uh, World Diamond Council system of warranties and how that works. You can read about the RJC and the types of standards that it has and its code of practices. And you can read the Signet Responsible Sourcing Protocol. Right. You can learn about OECD due diligence guidance. And you can do that in 15 minutes or a half an hour to get a good sense of what, what do I do next? How do I, now I know what to ask my suppliers. Okay. I, I think Even before that, I, you actually first have to decide what is your ethos. And yeah. I also want to know, is there, is there transparency to the public and when you have the what? certificate? I mean, like, if we're the ones that are going to, is there any transparency to us? Mm -hmm. Why did the RJC or the system of warranties, which is another discussion, stop with the middle market? Why, doesn't, why don't you make the same commitment? the same system we went to the consumer. We find that maybe people in the market kind of look at this game and say, hey, retailer's off the hook. He can sell whatever he wants. He's not guaranteeing with the system of warranties. Soon the warranty somehow stops. And I'm against you, please don't get me wrong here. I just think that that's an interesting factor. Everyone wants the consumer, the, the trade to make all these problems and audits and everything, but the retailers don't have to make a similar guarantee to the consumer. And so there's a question, and if I'm not mistaken, that's one of the things that you're asking. Yeah. If we're gonna already deal with some kind of standards, self-made standards or whatever, but Martin, shouldn't it go to the consumer? Yeah, of course, but you're saying something that's untrue again, right? I, I can't tell whether it's a rhetorical question or not. No, it's okay? not. Every because, question I'm the asking US can, The U.S. consumer should not be buying Russian diamonds right now. There's a ban in our government for Russian diamonds in this country. Okay, so. No, but it's not clear. It's not clear if it refers to that. But I'm asking a bigger point. Why doesn't Signet or someone else have a system of warranty statement on their invoices? Why is it only the trade that has to do a system of warranty? You will find it on every single Signet invoice. And your Signet, fine. Yeah. So you're a great and guy. It's open source. No, not great. But most I'm, companies. I'm here to share, just like the company's been doing for the 40 years I've been at it. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, open yeah. source. I'm, Everybody I'm not, can follow what we do. I'm not attacking Signet yeah. here. I think Cindy's doing a wonderful job in leadership and trying to introduce things, but I am talking about 
another 10,000 jewelers. And they sit there. And do they have to give any sister statement of warranty on their invoice? Probably not. We're looking at the level playing field the best that we can get. We see everybody, you know, these guys can do this, these guys can do that, these guys can say, I buy Russian goods in the United States of America because the president used the phrase, uh, instead of using the phrase source, he used the phrase uh, origin, which has legal Mickey Mouse stuff. All right, now, I'm a normal jeweler. I can look at your four things. I accept your point. Your advice to the jeweler is low out there and see that and we can check it out. But besides going into this uh, JC scenario, is there any other way that diamond manufacturers or jewelers outside of the RGC or whatever is, could give some level of assurance? You were going to say something before you listened. Well, Martin, first of all, I think the industry should be unified. Eh? We should have a unified vision. At the end of the day, there's a consumer out there that does not need to be confused. So we need to see that we protect the industry with what kind of messaging we tell to that consumer. But, but, but how can we be unified no, when the well, laws are different? Well, I, yes, I, I agree, Martin. But I think my point is, if we talk about SMEs not being able to do it, there's a duty as an industry to care and to bring them along the journey. You know, and a step could be then, their big aim can be RGC certification, but at the beginning, it's about education. Education on the legislation, on the consequences, giving them some tools, and there are lots of trade associations all over the world. And I just want to give an example. I don't know if some of you saw that this week, again, you have the Corporate Social Responsibility Directive on reporting of the EU. It has huge implications also globally. You have the new due diligence legislation that's coming on the renders. It's a lot to take. It's thousands of pages. How do you expect an SME to get through this? So, and there's the duty of the, of the I think, bigger players and industry associations to make it digestible, accessible, and get everybody on track. And that's where we need to accelerate now because we will lose momentum. And again, that will hit the reputation of the industry. So I believe education is key. And at one point, I also wanted to mention in the, uh, in the due diligence, OEC due diligence uh, five-step program is reporting. And if you look at some of the NGO reports, that is a big criticism on the industry. We don't report enough. And I believe that's also key that we need to learn to report on what we do. It's not going to be perfect. That's fine. We live in an imperfect world, but we need to tell the steps we're taking. We need to be honest about where we are in that journey of transparency and how we're going to come from point X to point Y. And I think that's the journey we're all on. And not just our industry, Martin, because I look at all different industries and they're also struggling with this. So it's just a few points I wanted to mention. Right. So I'm gonna leave, thank okay. you. Okay, we, we miss you, uh, David, gonna, but thank you but, very uh, much for being here today. But you're in good hands. We are surrounded, I'm sure, by like-minded people uh, yeah. who know how to get things done and, okay. um, and the way we are getting things done. And I, I hope in the spirit of education, like Iris has said, use your platform, Martin, and, we and help the industry. We, we, have, we have a four-step process, okay? That's one. If somebody else has something else, great, all right? But if somebody wants to get a start tomorrow on what we're talking about, I'm trying to share with you and everybody, everybody who's listening what the resources are right now. Okay. okay, I think that's, that's. I thank you, and it's great to see you. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting you me. Okay. For all the efforts that, that you're making personally and, and the company as well. Appreciate it. Getting back to maybe Alice. Is that Alice in there, right? No, it's all right. <laughs> what is that? I, I can't read Allison. it. Allison. You know what happens to me? I had this surgery there. Okay, Allison, <laughs> you're a retailer. I mean, you, you work with retail, you are retail. You, I'm sorry, I don't remember everybody's that's affiliations. Funny. Now, how does this play out to you? Is I this mean, I more would, confusion. Uh, or? Poor David's walking out the door, so he can't defend himself. But uh, you know, I handled our RJC certification when we were members before we pulled out of the RJC because the way they handled Al Rosa. Um, and then we were probably some 400 employees and some 20, 26 retail stores. And it, it was a midterm review. It wasn't even the, the full certification, and it took years off my life to both prep and to go through the audit. It's just, it's. It's incredibly robust, and I think it's great as a standard like that. I think it's a very high expectation for a small retailer, and I think even once, as a small retailer, if you're buying polished um, wholesale, like you're just, it's not, the, the RJC COP is not verification. The fact that you're buying from RJC certified member is not verification that they are not selling you Russian. Right. Okay, that's, that's an answer. Um, so what should we do? I mean, like I said, I think, Leanne, why are you so quiet? I mean, I, I, think, I think it's blockchain. Again, it's not going to be all, all diamonds. Um, some diamonds put on blockchain may be very clearly diamonds that none of us want. But I think 
it's blockchain is the scalable solution to spread it out across all the different supply chain actors. So ultimately that that retailer can prove to U.S. Customs when it comes down the line that it's not Russian because, mm -hmm. I mean, we're having an ethical conversation, but why should we have an ethical conversation when, when we know state and the EU are going to start blocking Russian rough, now polished wherever? I, I wouldn't trust state and the EU as far as I could throw them. I think governments are fundamentally corrupt because they have to take care of their national strategic interests. And if it's the case of India and Pakistan, and there's a discussion about nuclear deterrence. And then the Indian government says, listen, if you're going to start blockading Russian diamonds, please use the phrase, um, what was the phrase? Not source, don't use source. No. Use the phrase it's origin. You know, because why? The Indian ambassador says the president of the United States, do a personal favor. And just change that terminology around. So essentially, the United States sanctions on um, on, on, on Russian diamonds right now is, I promised my wife I'd use them, use poppycock, okay? <laughs> we'll use that phrase, okay? It's just total garbage. It's ridiculous. So as far as governments go, we sh as a trade, if you want to be an honest, ethical person, you have to comply with government law, but don't look for governments for any ethics. Hitler was duly elected, and it was perfectly legal, legitimate, and even ethical to kill Jews in Germany at the time. It was okay, you know? That's, that's what it is. I'll get to you in a second, but let's put the governments on the side. What should the jeweler do? And I think that we're not on one standard here, Iris. The law in the United States is distinctly different than the law in the UAE or in China about the importation of diamonds. So this kumbaya concept is also baloney, okay? We have to recognize this is going to be different standards, and then maybe we have to figure out how to turn it into an opportunity to make money. Because if you want sustainability, you have to sell your standard. And you know, so I'm concerned about everybody just doing their own thing. I'm also concerned about relying on governments. So we're going to, coming back to this, my concept of most the hallmarks. And maybe that's just me, because I'm crazy. But maybe other people have better ideas. But I think the blockchain, maybe with hallmarks, starts to become and um, what would you put into the, would it be the source of the diamond? Well, there's what just, information there's no, would you want have, as a I mean, even around the table, we have no shortage of solutions. We have GCAL, Sacrin, we have Everledger, we have Tracer, yeah. we have iTracit. I mean, do those, do those solutions work? Are they honest? Before we say it's not going to work, let's try it. You know, okay, so you we, think uh, let's try block, different We have solutions. blockchain enabled diamonds on our platform. It, it, let's, you know, if other people could pick up and adopt, then we could finally have mm -hmm. some sort of verification for a small set of diamonds and eventually scale. You need to start. I buy that. Right? I buy. Is there a danger of greenwashing? I mean, that's uh, uh, greenwashing is a strange term applied to Russian. I, it's not just Russian. I, I, Look, I, is there a danger? For, a, everybody's a, making are, standards from everywhere. These are technology solutions for chain of custody. Is that greenwashing? I mean, ultimately, someone will get something that says what the rough origin is, and then the person can determine, do they want to buy a rough and Russian rough origin, or do they want to buy... If you know the Russian rough. So you're saying that we have technology, we'll solve the problem of source. Maybe that's back to David. We use blockchain also to record all of this stuff, and then any retailer or consumer even can look up a diamond and know what's happening. And, so can, that's, and, and can make the choice if that's the origin that they want to support. Yeah, obviously, if, assuming the origin is correct. So you can have multiple standards right. based on where you are. If you're in UAE, it's different than if you're in Washington, and different than if you're in you know, Beijing. So I can accept that idea that we are transparent. Right. And then the blockchain can help us be transparent. So we still at the technical, you, you're going to say something. Maybe I'll add to what uh, Alison said. And, and again, I, th I think we are at the stage that through different technologies, and there are a multitude of technologies out there, that, that burden on the independent retailer, which I agree with most of what says, is impossible to, to put that burden on the independent retailer, um, can through the technologies provide them with what they need without having to do that full process. So maybe it goes back from a little bit from what, what David said, put it on the company, uh, but putting it back on the product. And I think that we are at the stage that that can be scaled. The technologies are mature enough to scale. Uh, and if there is that taken, everyone takes that first step, like Brilliant Earth have done and many others, uh, I think that more and more uh, goods will have that 
uh, traceability uh, of different types, and again, there are different levels and different assurances, and, and, and I'm not going to put a, a, you know, say what's better or worse, everyone needs to decide for themselves. Uh, but I think if that, the industry goes in that direction, and again, it's got nothing to do, I think, with Russian times at all, traceability started long before uh, the Russian um, the, the yeah. invasion of Ukraine. Uh, that was on the table five years ago. We started investing in developing solutions more than five years ago on that subject. So I think that that, that would provide a very uh, robust solution that doesn't contradict in any way RJC or, or anything else and understanding companies. But yes, it will s solve a lot of the challenges that the independent retailer who buys from a wholesaler, who buys from another wholesaler, and whoever knows the pipeline uh, knows that an independent reader cannot go back and check his, 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 uh, his, uh, his origin. They're supposed to ask questions. Uh, they'll ask questions and they'll get answers, yeah, and they that, have no idea if those answers have so any bad. truth whatsoever this, in those this, answers. like, I think it was 800 or 311 pages. But let me just say this, David, to, to ride on what you're saying. The technology exists, or will certainly shortly exist, that will solve the problem of provenance to some degree, certainly the rough, okay? We'll know where the rough came from. Chasing the goods in the factory, you might also have software that will show you how the rough emerged and evolved into this polished diamond. And the technology would have that done. And then maybe we can make some kind of a hallmarks that would say, okay, these diamonds are suitable for trade in the United States. You know? These diamonds may be a different hallmark. But Assuming we can communicate that, something was said, which was also very smart. Let's start slowly. Let's see where we can go. And here I'd like to reach out to you. You've been working on this concept of ethical gold. There was the No Dirty Gold campaign. Then there's gold with mercury, which was also OK, once you know that the artisanal community had some benefit. And now we're talking about trying. How many years have you been working on this? Well, actively as a nonprofit for six years now. Six years. And you've been working on six years to create a market for non-mercury or all the mercury, no mercury. You have different standards there. Yet you got like the Russian goods, yes and no. You got, you got. I'm, I'm, I'm not so much a standards guy. You OK, know, I, so I'm, what happens? Tell right. us about what happened with you, your efforts, so, to take a product that's well-defined Mercury free gold and to get it into the marketplace. Well, what's the well, difference? it's actually Martin. Yes, it, but it goes back further prior to that in that there are and I know I, this is repetitious for a lot of you perhaps, but it's there are 20 million people roughly in the world who do use mercury every day to capture their gold because they have to because there are no alternatives that are really viable and available to them. So and in that process, they release 12,000 pounds roughly of mercury, which is a virtually permanent neurotoxin. And they then supply by, they're 20% of the gold supply chain. And so we, we buy, the gold that we buy has all of that mixed in. We get it from large scale, we get it from small scale. Some people buy it through fair mines gold, which is very, the, you know, the premier of the, of the ethical, the responsibly sourced gold. But there is a mass of uh, people out there who are polluting themselves, polluting the environment, because mercury gives them an edge. Mercury allows them to be effective at a level that they could not be. So six years ago, I said, look, we're solving everything. There's nothing that technology is not solving. So why don't we take this on? And I've been speaking to the jewelry. I know we had a conversation six years ago about how we can come together. Iris is saying we have to be united. This is something we have to take a stand on the issues that matter because this is a reputational risk that I don't know that there's really an equal. If you consider blood diamonds as a risk, yes, it got publicized. What if it were publicized that, broadly publicized that we are allowing, we are standing by while 20 million people and the 100 million who depend on them are still, is this a human rights abuse that we are standing down, we are letting this happen without really taking any action on it? That's what, that's what I, I mean, I've been, so I've been working at this, I had an inventor come to me, a number actually, GIA sponsored our, our initial uh, assessment of some Peruvian gold ore that we ran. We had six processors, actually five only ultimately did it, but gave them a chance to uh, evaluate their effectiveness. So 
The University of Arizona analyzed the, the processors, came up with one that was really a standout in its ability to capture gold at a rate significantly better than the miners can with mercury. So I took that down to Columbia in April and showed miners, showed them how to use it. Use, they used their ore with it. And they said unanimously, virtually, this is great. We will use this. This will allow us to make more money and, not, and use less or no mercury. So that's what I, it's something that I think we could massively benefit from by an industry of being united. Not that we have to be our only focus, but have that be a focus, instrumental focus, have a, an action council from the industry that says, we're taking this on because it's the right thing to do. Does it make money? Of course it makes money. Anytime you're doing something right, if it's not making money, it's it just whatever works. It, it's, uh, this is the right thing to do. I, I don't, let's, let's go, let me go to you there and say, can it make money? No, my question really is, I don't, maybe I'm naive, but if, if we can trace where the lab diamonds come from, why can't we trace where the mine diamonds come from? And why can't it be traced in the chain of custody? Why can't it? I don't understand why we're even arguing. The, 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 let me explain that. We are working now to come up with the scenarios where we can actually trace the flow of the diamond from rough to polished. So but, why can't it be transparent? Well, there's a lot of different kinds of diamonds. First of all, if you had a 100 carat diamond, you probably could trace it pretty easily. No, I understand. But you're talking about producing millions of diamonds, especially if you get them smaller in size, OK? And they're impossible to trace. Now, bigger stones, certified diamonds, syringe diamonds, say, OK? <coughs> can be traced, and I think we're on the cusp of technology which will be able to ensure people in a reasonable way that this polished diamond came from this rough. Some of it involves getting ERP of companies and some of it involves syringe of how you're doing and there are different solutions. So let's assume we'll solve it, but it isn't solved right now. People switch diamonds every minute of every day. Imagine but I have a guy- if there was a tracer on it. What? If there was a tracer and the GIA had it, like the serene, if they had it on there or where's this, um, AI, what are we talking about? Yeah, but these are, these are terms right? I throw at right? AI. We have tracing. all these things now coming yeah. out, right? It's not but, so simple. <laughs> but I'm saying that, that is what, that's what I'm yeah, looking but the at. Big, but the bigger issue is, let's assume for a minute that it's not done perfectly yet, but there are things that are going on that are very good, and they will be emerging over the next year, I would assume. Maybe, Go ahead. maybe I'll, Speak, I'll relate David. To, yeah, please. to your question. I, I don't think the problem is the, the capability or the technology. It's the desire or the demand right. uh, that people need to say, we need this, we want this, this is good for us, this is good for our client. So I don't think the problem today is the capability. The capabilities are there. Yes, if you want to scale to 100 million, that's, that's a diamonds a year, that's, that's more challenging, but it's possible. If there is a demand, it will happen. And I think that, that we, we are still not united maybe in the demand of saying, this is important to our industry. But this is the point here. Right. And, and this is why it's so great to have you two guys here talking, representing diamond manufacturers, OK? Can we make money with this? Now, you say, oh, you can make money. And I didn't ask you how much more your mercury-free gold cost above the gold price. But is it 10%? How much is it, roughly? Yeah, we don't actually know, Martin, yet. Because okay. this is, we, don't, we don't have a mercury-free gold supply chain. It's not been established. Okay. We are just on the edge Fine. of, we need to scale this okay, process okay, okay. now. So I got it, I got it. Right. But I want to move on. Yep. Let's take a look at diamonds. Both of you guys represent diamond manufacturers. Mm -hmm. You know, and diamond manufacturers wake up in the morning and they say, how can I make some more money? Right. Can I make this diamond a excellent cut? Right. Or should I just make it a fair cut? Mm -hmm. And we learned from the experiences of the GIA XXX, that companies, in fact, did choose to make better quality diamonds. Congratulations to the Sarin, of course, but also due to the grading system giving you a XXX. 80% of the goods now, in the beginning, there are very few. And GI didn't even have a cut grade rolling back. But now the technology is going to But let me ask you, is this a business? In other words, if I said to you, oh, we have these wonderful kosher diamonds, right? Do you know there's no kosher restaurant in this hotel? kosher style a little bit, but nothing. And I'm going, my God, that's crazy. They should smart. But there is no kosher restaurant here. Obviously, there's not enough demand. 
Now we're talking about kosher diamonds or we're talking about socially responsible diamonds. We're talking about blockchain, blockchain. We're talking about GI certificates that maybe have DOR on them or something. And now the question is, can, you, can we make more money as an industry by being socially responsible? Is there, is, this, is there some altruistic notions that we have? It depends if we add more money to what we're doing. In other words, if every single time we add a piece which is going to add more money to the end result, how am I supposed to sell it? It also depends on Can you where, get where more money? Demand. He was talking right. about where, where are we exactly located? what David was saying. Where are we located? Are, are my consumers... Um, am I in the city? Am I, you know, in a, in a suburb where they can afford so it? So do your retailers, the people you sell, yeah. do you think, and you're, you're doing this, Allison, that it is possible to make a higher profit margin yes. because That's you were able to make an affirmative statement about the social responsibility of the product? It also depends on marketing. Ah, 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 oh, no, no, this is a very powerful point. Because some people think, oh, there's nothing there, you can't make, but you haven't marketed it. They didn't market the triple X. And they started to market the triple X so that everybody transitioned to it, even it cost about 3% more to create. So the marketing, then. Is the marketing, or would there be a marketing solution for something like a hallmark? Yeah, of course. Just like lab. So we'd all agree on. This is a hallmark for the yeah. United States, it's not a hallmark for China, okay? And it Something says, this is the condition of this diamond, okay? It didn't come from Angola, where we're not sure it came from Botswana. So we're sure that the, the, the ethical, whatever it is, is okay, okay? But um, this idea of a Walmart, in my view, that's what we tried with the Green Star idea, but maybe we're too strict, but this idea, do you think you can get more money from your customers? Well, I'm gonna ask you a question. Yeah. If you get a... A certified stone by GIA. Yeah. Can you make more money than a sure. non-certified stone? That's why people do it. So there you go. So you think that social responsible you give more, certification? You give more information. And you think you can get a higher more, price? Yes. Yes. So it's the it's it's the no. today you have that younger generation. I'm watching it happen. All they want is economically, you know, is is it clean? Is it this? Mm -hmm. Is it that? I'm, I'm drinking avocado juice right now. I don't care how much it's going to cost. It's, this is their, their mind frame. We're, we're like literally So why hasn't that. it happened yet? Marta? There's no transparency. Uh, I, I didn't get Jared yet. He's been around for a Marketing long. is expensive. And, marketing and is really not, expensive. And we're the end. We can only market what we... But you want to make more money, and you can make more money by marketing something. When you, why wouldn't you invest money? You want to get, I'll get it in a minute, but I want to give Jared a chance. I was going to say, you know, like, country of origin does not an ethical diamond make. Right, like you just brought up Angola. So you know, when you get that organic sticker on a banana, right, you're thinking about the benefits to your health, maybe or not. Most people know that it isn't necessarily healthier for you, but it is healthier for the workers in that community, right? Maybe it's less toxic, maybe. So if you're putting a green star next to it, how how confident are we that the story has been? hopefully not harmful, right? That should be the baseline all the way through cutting. Depends right. on the rabbi. Depends who's putting out the green star. I mean, you look at kosher, for example. Should we different... demand benefit? Like, what? Should, there, should there be sufficient benefit? Now we're talking about what community? are your standards How do we for... prove that taxes yeah. have now, been now paid you're talking about, right? What should the standards be for Hallmark, if there is one? What should the standards be for a company like Tiffany? It says, I don't even want to put out any stars. I, everything you buy from me is socially responsible, and I don't even want to differentiate my products. And then you get all these jewelers out there, thousands of them, who are saying, what should I do? How can I communicate it? So I think we do need something like a hallmark. We do need to get an understanding of some baseline. But the real question is going to be, can we market it? And that's why I was talking with David Kelly, and so I don't see him here now. But you know, this morning, the question is, how? Can we capture, we can create value, everyone. I think that there's a good sense here that we can create value using new technology. We will be able, the technology is coming down the pipeline. It'll happen. But now can we capture that value? And you say to me, the key to capturing the value is to spend money on marketing. Right. Is that what we're seeing here? That's what sells. Okay, well, you, are you having a, she had not a chance to say yes. anything yet, although. So, yeah, so let me see if I can tie a few of these strands together. So 
I don't know if you've been down to the lab grown. I think that is case in point that marketing works. It's like you're walking into a jungle. I think your logo has to be green to have a booth down there. And it's based off of nothing, right? It's just a claim that there's no comparative environmental or social LCA that proves that lab is better. They're just I'll making claims. And right now, there is no legal definition for organic, sustainable, ethical, right? So everybody is just saying whatever they want to say based on nothing. But based on academic research, we have this idea of kumbaya, wouldn't it be great if we are all unified and agree? Yes, because everybody is throwing this out. But if you look at standards that have been successful, like anti-trafficking in persons, it's one organization that takes the lead and says, I'm sick of this nonsense and I'm going to stick my neck out and say what the standard is. And you can get on board or not. So the issue, and going back to organic, is when that happens, who is that standard made for? The people who can afford the audit. Back to Iris's point and some others, it leaves the smaller players out because you can't afford the audit. So I think we have to unpack this a little bit of people are marketing nonsense, someone has to take the lead, but we have to figure out is it going to be a one-size-fits-all solution? Probably not, and let's not take failures from other industries and replicate them here. That makes a lot of sense. Look, I tell you, I think it all goes down to money. If we establish a standard, a group of us, or Rhea, Ravenport, or anyone, and you can actually get higher money for that because it's certified source legitimacy. And the guy doesn't care. When I, when I get a kosher thing, I, I, I don't care which cow was milked or where or, 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 or what happened with the cocoa beans. Or I know that it's all kosher. They're not saying that it's ethical. They're saying it's simply kosher, right? So I don't have to know the name of the miner or the, I don't, you can use it as a marketing gimmick or something or whatever, that's fine. But I just need to know that it's kosher. And then I eat it because I'm hungry. Okay. So what we need to think about here, and I'm, this is helping me think about maybe Hallmark, maybe some standard that isn't perfect, but that's out there that people can accept that retailers would agree with. But the bottom line is, can you make more money with it? If you publish a nonsense standard and you say, okay, my name is your KPI, you can pay me more, you know. Eh, okay, it's nothing. It doesn't. You, maybe David comes along and says, "Okay, I've got a diamond with a story with a journey," and you look at it and you see it, and I'll pay me more money for the diamond. You say, "Oh, sure, I love that story," and you know it's all there. You know, Gabby Tolkowski, we should just passed away just a week ago or something. He had music. He said, "You can take a diamond, and every diamond would have a unique musical song." You can take a minute, but so I think that the key is going to be if we can sell it, and if we can sell it, then. It'll happen. And marketing or selling or differentiating or the jewelry store is different, the supplier is different. You know, this is a unique selling proposition. You know, I think that if we can establish some kind of a community agreement on something, and maybe Rappaport will do it, and other people at the RJC will try to do it if they want to, then the jeweler will say, Does it have a green star? I don't want to know anymore. Okay. Martin, I think, that's, that, yeah, I think we're case in point. We, we are a mission-driven company. We provide origin on all our certified stones to our customers. We started with two people in 2005 with a mission to give them origin. We started on an e-commerce platform, and now we're, you know, um, how many years in? And we have 31-plus stores, 600-plus employees, and reported 440 million net sales in 2022. How much more can you make on the diamonds that have origin? Do you have diamonds? Other diamonds All of our certified have? stones have origin. All stones have origin. All certified stones have origin. All certified. And non-certified? All, non all, our, all our vendors are, are aware of our approved origins. Yeah. So the question is this. How much more money can you make? The Bears, I think, put out a study last year, 10 to 15%. Does that resonate with you? Do you think that you can make 10 to 15% more on two diamonds that have known origin? Those aren't questions for me. What? Those are questions for my CFO, not for me. That's a question for your CFO. Okay. But as we sit here today, you guys to try size of to make the most you can from your diamonds, right? Yeah, but a small, like if you're selling a, a bracelet that's $99, you're not going to add more onto the marketing product because then you make absolutely zero. Right. So we have to consider the size of the product, where it's in the pipeline. Is it jewelry? Is it loose? There's lots of considerations before you know if you're going to make money based on marketing or not. Yeah, Not so this, this, what you're saying is really vital because what you're saying is we need to segment out our markets. We have to identify who are the markets that are interested in the social responsibility. It may not be a 
Chinese store in Shanghai. It may be a U.S. retailer in Rodeo Drive, okay? But if we can segment out the markets, we can hit partial victories. I don't know that we can solve the whole industry in two seconds, but we can start to say we have some premium luxury products. And our premium luxury products include social responsibility sourcing, maybe some certificate or blockchain, maybe something about the gold that makes it better. So I think that we're, we're just kind of driving to the point where we're thinking about this like a premium product. And if we sell it as a premium product, then people, and I think that maybe you've already discovered now, so you said, hey, look at us. We, we're this great store that everybody loves. We're really in Earth. We're, we're doing good things. We're, 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 and I'm, we're getting all those millennials and Gen Z customers. And, and we're also treating our employees correctly. And we're doing all kinds of new age stuff. And I think a lot of the independent jewelers will go to you. They'll be like you. They'll emulate you, which is probably a good it's a good thing, okay? So this approach that we may want to take should drive us through money, through you guys. Because, you know, they talk about who's going to pay for marketing. I don't see why people should pay for marketing and then have the beers raise the price of rough. It doesn't appeal to me. But if you spend money in your brand and the money is spent on social responsibility and then that translates forward to your customers, you're adding value on the product for your customer to collect. It means the capturing of value would basically happen at retail. And that's a feature. I don't think dealers care that. But then again, it'll, it'll become dealers too because <laughs> if I can get a, like a GIA certificate, you said so it right. That's if they care. What? That's if they care. But you, you have to select that. Those customers that care. Don't try to sell steak to vegetarians. No, I'm just you know what I'm saying? We're, you want, we're and, in and, the business to make money. So that's if, you know what I mean? So it, it, it's, there's so many facets that go into us when we're trying. We have to be competitive with our you know, with our competitors. We have, we, if we're a small business and you're a big business and obviously you can sell it for less than what we're selling. I mean, there's so out. much in mind. Mm -hmm. There's just so much. Yeah, but, but you gotta pick something right. that will differentiate you. Right. Um, and the question is, is social responsibility that thing? Look at the show. Designers, I have better, not, and you all these people running, the only people that are talking about social responsibility are the synthetic guys. Okay, so maybe we need to think no, about no, that. No, and and you, know, you wanted to say something. Yeah. Marta, <laughs> you know when we talk about social responsibility, it's not an option not to be. We don't sell wash machines, right? We sell, we're in the business of selling emotions. So, I don't know. I, well, I, I wish Martin, I could and if we want to add value. If I I'm think... sitting in Dubai tomorrow, and but, I got, I, I, we sell $500,000 of recycled no, no. diamonds, they don't care if they're recycled. The Martin, Indian buyers come and they buy. I think, yeah, but that, I think that brings us to the earlier discussion that if you want to be a uh, responsible business, of course, it will depend on the leader of the business, on the CEO of the business and what their strategy is. You're saying it's is. altruistic? Excuse me? Is it altruistic? Is it the leader no, of the business saying, the I'm day, a nice no, guy, no, no, no. I it's not. It's not altruistic, Martin. At so the end of the day, everyone wants to, be, wants to make... Uh, it wants to be economically viable, let, let there be no discussion. But what I am very worried about is in this industry, where there's already not so much transparency often, when we are going to start telling stories without the right proof points, that's a risk for the whole industry. The and, I think, and, that's, and, and when we talk about social responsibility, it is not just about greenwashing, bluewashing, pinkwashing, SDG washing. There are different topics that we need to consider. Yes, one is traceability. One is climate action. We're not talking about some hot topics here. Biodiversity, human rights due diligence, diversity and inclusion. Okay, so we'll we have a long way to go. So my call for action is let's step by step move the industry, the whole industry. And I agree, you know, we are at different levels of maturity, but let's get everyone on that journey through education, through giving them tools, to telling them what the legislation is. It starts with complying with the law. Some companies don't know that. And I think there's a huge duty. And also allow me then, and I haven't been able to say much about the initiative I lead, the Watch and Jew Initiative 2030. Who would have thought in this ecosystem that an organization like that would exist? Two competitors, the Caring Group and Cartier. We're almost getting to 50 leaders now that have committed on very strong commitments, science-based targets, biodiversity, big topic on human rights, due diligence, gender, ASM engagement. 
it is not an easy journey. This coalition, I'm really proud to say, they are re really working hard to get it right. Will it all be right? No, it's a journey. But I'm just saying we need strong leadership, but we also need to be very careful in making claims to sell. Because also the law, look at Europe now with the green claims, it will, it will really hurt our business if we're going to start misleading the consumer on yes. things we can't even prove right. Yeah. So I just wanted to express that concern. I, I think you're right. right. But we have a lot of questions coming in I from the people who are... Hans, Hans who's, on, who's a panelist online, would like to be able to add. Yeah, yeah. Hans, can we, can we do some magic over here and bring in the people that are online? I, I'm going to try to go on a Zoom myself here. If someone could send me also the link to the Zoom so I could see what's going on, Ari, or someone out there. Please, uh, can we shift over? Here we go. Here's Hans. Hi, Hans. <laughs> Can't hear you. Not yet. Well, you need, we're hearing you very lightly like this, so maybe you can boost your something. Or... Yeah, I can't, I can't. There you go. Be Better. I think it's an interesting point. I think it's a really important point, but I essentially disagree with you. We've been sitting around getting transparency. So what are you doing with the transparency? People, women are raped right now in the CAR by Wagner people. Yeah, you, know, you want transparency? Here's your transparency. What you can do about it? So I say that we can separate the good from the unknown. And we have demand, we have consumer demand for the good. We need to sell good stuff. Now we're not gonna solve the entire problem of all the transparency about all the artisanal sectors, about all the things that we need to do in a hundred million people or a million people, 20 million people being poisoning themselves is, is not a minor issue, don't get me wrong. But what I'm saying, Hans, is that we have to take a step forward to ensure our customers that they can buy a kosher diamond. That doesn't mean all diamonds are kosher. That doesn't mean that we're not ignoring other diamonds that should be made kosher. And we do need to go with the lowest hanging fruit that we can be absolutely assured of. So I would say to you that yes, this is a work in progress, but there needs to be milestones. And I think the milestone in 2023 that we're facing as an industry, I think is some kind of a hallmark or some kind of green diamond or other diamond where people can say, I understand what's going on, saying to every retailer to understand the story of the OECD and, and this supplier versus that supplier is going to be problematic. So I therefore think we will have to establish some kind of a scenario here where a U.S. retailer, and I very much spoke today about the smaller independent retailer, a U.S. retailer has to be having an opportunity to play this important role as a provider, as a supplier of, 
of the uh, of an ethical product, and who knows how he's going to define ethical. But I, I do want to just come back to you and Hans also and Terrace. The brands, I think the brands are leading the way. It was the brands that stepped away from RJC when the Russian source issue first came up, okay? And brands have to worry about their reputation more than a small jeweler because, you know, there's that story, of course, with, with, with uh, I think it was with Nike, we're producing sneakers in, uh, in uh, I think it was, I don't know, Vietnam, and they were using child labor, and their share price went down 50%. Their sales went down 60%. This is in the 1990s. So, you know, I think we have to respond to the needs of our customers. And then very carefully with this greenwashing, we've done so much greenwashing with the KP, it's, it's hard to believe. That. And now RJC may be greenwashing, you know. Uh, certainly the system of warranties, it's beyond the scope of this conversation today, but Iris, you've got the brands. They're leaders. They have the most to lose if they're found to be selling an unethical product. And they hold themselves to a high standard. What can we learn from them? What should the rest of the industry learn? And, you know, and what should we do? And, and Hans, I don't mean to cut you out. I'd love for you to respond to whatever Iris is saying about the brands, because you're at the artisanal. You're, you're way out at the other end, but you're the NGO there. But I'm really interested if there's daylight between Iris and, and Hans and what you guys think. Back to Hans. There he is. Yeah. Microphone, hold the microphone to your mouth or something. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a really important point here that if you look at the claims made by the synthetic guys, you have to say, well, what about the, the, the million diggers? Do they starve to death because I'm going to be ethical, so I'm going to cut them out of the market? I don't know what to tell you about that, although sometimes the answer is yes, particularly among the brands. They say, I'm sorry, I don't have to sell diamonds from Zimbabwe. I don't have to do it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to look at, into every possible scenario there. And then if people want to get those diamonds, maybe there'll be an alternative market like China or whatever. But I think that when we look at the United States market and the threats coming after us in terms of the legitimacy of diamonds, the whole question of diamonds are a legitimate product. We need to take forward steps that say, yes, these diamonds are legitimate for sure, especially with this Russian thing coming. So, you know, there's a question, but I do go back to you, Iris, and say, can the brands insure? Because there was a statement here that you can't know. You, you, I, what we do with the Green Stars, we're taking goods from Okavango directly to GIA, DOR, using science to make sure this polish came from this rough. But we're not even telling you that it was manufactured in a good place. So you're right that it's not perfect. But Iris, I think that we need to look at the brands and learn from their experiences. First of all, they know how to capture added value. Second of all, they have a keen interest in making sure they don't get any bad diamonds into the distribution. We should also look at Hans's point is, are they being responsible by not helping the artisanal sector and just throwing them in the garbage, okay? And I'm not even looking at the issue of, of synthetic competition. I don't care, cubic zirconia, send everybody Swarovski. But here is, what are the brands doing to ensure that they're not selling blood diamonds? Yeah, we'll get it. I don't know what they're doing. Either. Thank you. So first of all, you know, I've had the privilege now to be about 10 months in the role and working very closely with many of the most beautiful brands in the world. I think one thing I see from the brands is they have a very long-term vision to protect their integrity of, 
you know, of what they've built. They have built a legacy. They're based on creative artisanal skills. Um, they have multiple years of, uh, you know, working with creators, with suppliers. You see, you know, from, from Italy to France to wherever in the world, but you see there's a lot of care in the whole supply chain. Uh, second, I think they're very uh, committed uh, from moving just away from a risk compliance perspective to a development perspective. You see many brands, and I just don't want to mention one or two because <laughs> there have many, but what you see is many of those brands have been 10 years ago already working on issues that we didn't even touch. So they are ahead. And that's why, Martin, I'm actually concerned because I see, you know, working with a lot of the brands and also having the privilege to work with many of the suppliers now, is that the brands do have a vision more long term. They're looking at, you know, different approaches, uh, alternative materials, you know, uh, and this can be, you know, more climate friendly, like looking at materials in nature. Um, so they have this big vision and they also definitely want to contribute to development in, an, in, an, in a real sense. So my view is, I think that with the coalition that we've created, it's, we want to be very complementary to the good work that's being done in the industry and lead the way in helping advance the agenda of sustainability. And when I look at our three pillars, uh, the first pillar, climate, that is a very big uh, journey. And when we think about climate action, and for example, science-based targets, the biggest emissions is in scope three. This is supplier services. So this means is we need to again bring in the small enterprises. So this, we have this huge duty to bring everyone along. Same with the third pillar, for example, human rights. One of the elements that came out of the stakeholder consultation was that many suppliers said, you know, Iris, human rights, due diligence, yes, we want to try to do it, but it's quite complicated. So currently, you know, some really great experts are working on a human rights navigator for SMEs. It will be publicly available um, by September. And what we're going to do, and I think there'll be a test case, is we're not just going to launch this tool, we're actually going to give some help desk support with a trial of some companies and see, you know, is it efficient? What are you missing? How can we bring you on the journey? And then hopefully fine tune it. So for us, there's also some elements of learning and then hopefully piloting that work and scaling it um, and giving it back to the, to the wider industry. So my view is we can learn a lot from the brands in long-term vision, in their approach integrity, in their management systems, in their data reporting approach. And I think finally, at the end of the day, these are heritage brands, right? They've been created over decades. So they have this huge responsibility to protect the, the values they stand for. But at the end of the day, we are all a brand. Each one of us is a brand as an organization within that value chain. Because where it gets disrupted, it hits the, the, the whole industry. And that's where I am often very concerned. Have the brands coalesced on a standard? Excuse this, me, Martin? Like, if you look at Tiffany, or you look at Cartier, or you look at Richemont, or you look at the other guys, LVMH, is there, are they coalescing? Are they agreeing on a common standard? Are they using yes, the well, RJC first standard? Of all, I think, what standard are they using? Well, no, I think, first of all, many of the brands uh, are, uh, I think most of the brands are RJC certified, but at the same time, they have their own proprietary additional systems. Is, uh, there, is there agreement among them for some kind of a common standard as to what they're putting on top of, like David was talking about the four levels you know, so let's say RJC is just a level, mm -hmm. and now we go to a higher level, okay? That higher level, is there any understanding among the brands? The well, I cannot speak, uh, Martin, I'm not a spokesperson on behalf of all the brands, but what I just can see is that many brands, and this is all something even from my knowledge before I went into the, in this world, is that, of course, many brands have additional proprietary systems to protect the integrity. So they do invest a lot in that value chain because of the fact that they want to protect that uh, promise to the, to the consumer. And I think that's where, where, where they're so strong at. And each brand might have some additional nuances, which is fine, but at the end of the day, integrity is at the heart of, uh, of everything they do. But there's no constant standard. We all agree no. this standard. No, of course, no, no, there and is. RJC. There is. And, and I go back to what was said earlier. O OECD. The, the five-step OECD due diligence, due and guiding principles on business and human rights. I think the brands are more advanced in general on everything uh, on climate, science-based targets, now SBTN with nature. 
uh, operationalization of human rights due diligence, going a bit more deeper. Some brands uh, are, uh, have certain engagements uh, with ASM. So it all, it all depends on the brand, but yeah, they, they, they lead the way. That's very clear. So wait, so this is amazing. So what's happening is this. We're looking at the small retail jeweler. And we're saying we need to feed that small retail jeweler the, the system of warranty, something, some information that makes him comfortable that at least he's not selling bad stuff. And we put that onus and responsibility on the middle markets, on the people who are manufacturing the diamonds, dealing the diamonds, etc. Okay, one second. Do questions, audience, engage them, please. Okay, we will get to the audience in a minute. Um, but, and, and so, Richard, if you could do whatever you need to do to get the, the Zoomed up there, and, and uh, can you send me a link here also, Joshua and Israel, uh, for this? But to answer the question, though, um, if we can figure out, see, the brands are coming from the retailer to the supply chain. And then there's requirements somehow from the supply chain to the retailer. So when I look at the brands, they're saying it's our responsibility to make sure the diamonds are correct. The hell with the supply chain. We're going to make sure that we manage the supply chain that's supplying our Tiffany store, and we're responsible for making sure everything is kosher. We're right and, in the middle. Yeah, on the other so hand, we, we like, have to do the you right also thing show them stuff. Yeah, from. but they're but they're 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 verifying, they're validating, they're auditing, they're managing. Now we have another story here with a lot of independent jewelers. And we have to think about, well, how can we provide that? They're not like coming up by Tiffany saying, these are my standards. They're, they're just independent jewelers. They're, they just want to know that they can do something correctly and they don't have the resources of the larger brands. So now it's an interesting scenario is what is the role of the middle market? We can't, we're not going to take responsibility for Tiffany. Tiffany takes responsibility for Tiffany. But Joe Jeweler, he can't take responsibility for his supply chain. There's no way. And he's still about, I don't know, two thirds or 50% of the market. So, and we're living off of them. People in the show here, it's all about those independent Jewish. So we have to think about what can we do for them that'll be at the same level maybe as a, a, a secure thing. I'm gonna shift these computers here. I click on this here. Why don't you do it for me? All right, so anyways, I just thought that would maybe one you want to thing. say something, or maybe yeah. you want to say something Because we, we deal with all those major luxury brands, and so they push us on all of their, what, what the requirements are. We then, by doing the right thing and by learning from that, our retailers, our independent retailers benefit because we've gotten our shit together. So everything that they're saying, here's what you do to be a better company, we're able to then add value to our independent retailer because we are doing it, we are following. So those people that are providing suppliers to brands are learning about the social responsibility required when it comes to sourcing, and then we should take those ideas and, and apply them to the rest of the customers that are out That's there and do. let them know we can provide you with the level of due diligence that you would require overall. to make claims without greenwashing. Yeah. Go ahead, Avis. I think, I think the world has changed so much. You know, probably 15 or 20 years ago, suppliers had, were sitting in an isolated cell, right? And then you had suppliers, manufacturers, and you had brands or other companies. Today, it's an extended network. It's one family. And I think that will become much, much stronger. And what I see today is that brands deliver a lot of capacity building and education to their suppliers, because this can be on quality, this can be on integrity, this can be on sourcing, on expertise, great. But this is something that we will have as a cascade effect over the whole industry. And I think that's where this individual accountability, and I love, I, I fully agree with you, Alicia, that, that there now the challenge lies is to bring those those small components step by step together. It won't, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. It won't happen overnight. But I think we can learn a lot from that uh, supplier's network. And also allow me to say, you know, we're very proud. We've made a collaboration with Global Compact, which is the largest sustainability initiative in the world that has so much content from other industries. And what we said is we're not going to reinvent the wheel. We're going to take this content and we're going to make actually adjust it to the industry of jewelry, where we want to work with brands examples to expire, but also small manufacturer, supplier. And this is something that we're working on in content. And again, this will be open to the industry because we believe these topics are key to educate and advance the industry. And as our initiative, we believe that we are in that position to help advance the industry on these uh, 
on these important topics, not just to the consumer, but to society at large. Will they come out with standards? We are not a standards body. Everyone says they're not a standards body. So that's, I mean, that's it, right? It's who, who owns the claims? Who owns the claims? Who's going to get sued? Like if a retailer says something and says it has, it's worth more because it's this. The retailer will be sued. The, right. the, the director then, of the company is accountable. Yeah. Right, exactly. So who should own the claim? Although I think this is ultimately the transparency that Hans is asking about, right? Is ultimately accountability, right? Even in the... In the, it's, uh, the, it's, the it's the person making the sale. In, in the United States, you had the problem with certificates and you had certificates that were EGL certificates that were ridiculously over grading, right? right? So the retailer is responsible. If you put something out there and you make a statement, you're responsible for the statement. That's what worries me like crazy about the statement of warranties, the World Diamond Council. It's horrible. Mm -hmm. You're guaranteeing right. everything. You know? That's right. Well, no, it doesn't even guarantee. <coughs> it suggests no, you no, no. should the not word, no, shall. No, 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 it says the word guarantee in there. Or, okay. But it also, but for example, for in following the... Um, the UN guidance on, on uh, business, business and human rights principles, it says you should, not you shall. The so guidance, there's a lot of words. The guidances are bullshit to some degree. But I think that what we really need to understand is what commitment are we making to a customer and have to be sure we're not greenwashing. And this, this problem here is real because it's going to become, you know, we're lucky that we can talk about this today in Las Vegas and we're not five years from now when we would look at it and say, oh my God, we, we lost the market. No one wants to have diamonds. When I hear brands are considering alternative materials, yeah. Yes, but be careful. I'm not talking about alternative, alternative materials to diamonds. I don't want to see something here. I'm talking about alternative, you know, alternative materials. This can be from, from uh, yeah. leather to the to the. Watches. I was at the Bears booth and you're seeing uh, re 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 They're saying they're saying re recirculated cardboard. Yeah, I understand that. But the point yeah. is that everyone, consumers, brands, are looking for alternative materials. And I, I don't think that diamonds are just guaranteed to be there forever. The diamond will be there forever, but I don't know about the market. And I think that there's a sense in the industry that we must move forward. We must do more to make the diamond more attractive to these generations of people who are interested in this aspect of it. Yeah. Yeah, Martin, I, I just want to go back to your Nike example because I loved it. And actually when I studied, I did the Nike case. So I, I thought it was funny you, you said it because the Nike case they were so hit so hard. And look at Nike today. And you, when you go on their website, you will see their, their supplier list, their assessments. You look at their whole collection that is completely biodegradable. They've got, again, new shoe coming up. Fantastic. You've got now Signet that says they're going to literally uh, communicate about their suppliers. Mm -hmm. I think this is now a shift that we need to realize as an industry right. that's happening. And it's a mindset. And it means everyone has to go along in that mindset. And I, think and I don't blame everyone. Why does everyone have to go along? You think the Minister of Mines of Zimbabwe is going to go along with your mindset? He couldn't give a damn about you. But let's be realistic, because this kumbaya nonsense, it's just not fair. It's not true. It's not honest. OK? You have people that should not be in this industry. But and I don't need point, to build an umbrella I? for them. I could tell them how I would use the umbrella on them. I'm that's saying, another story. I am saying. It is the duty, I mean, I wouldn't even say it's the duty. I think it's really important that the industry has a very strong mindset and willingness to commit to transparency and traceability and trust, full stop. But, but, You're right, at the end of the day, I, I, can't, we, I can't ask someone X or Y to do it, but I'm just saying as an industry, we should really now push that agenda forward. And that means it's every small step matters. Yes, we won't change the whole world, but if we can change 60% of the world, we've done well. And yes. that's the process of continuous improvement. And if we don't have that ambition to change and to move the agenda, what are we doing? As I said, we are selling beauty and emotions. So I find we have a double responsibility to do things right. Yeah, I, I'm not disagreeing with yeah. you. But I am saying one thing. One of the greenwashing energizers has been this nonsense of we have to be with everybody. So we have to be with Zimbabwe. They're the chair of the Kimberley process. We have to be with all kinds of companies that do all kinds of things in the UAE, even if they're on the sanctions list. 
we have to be fair to people who are Russian oligarchs in the sanctions list. We have to be open to mines where maybe they're polluting the waters. Now, this have to stuff is to stop. What we have to do is split this industry as brutally as we have to, to ensure that there is an industry that is social responsibility and that there's other people. Martin, if I may, yeah. I just must disagree there. I, I think we'll never, we'll never join that way. We'll never be unified as we have to. It's, it's going to come down to the people who are willing to and the people who are going to publicize that they're willing to, and they'll stand up and they'll be counted, and they'll talk about the difference that's being made, that's where this will happen. It will never be, we're going to have the whole industry yeah, be I agree something. With you. Right? I agree with you. I agree with you. You may have misunderstood me. I'm making it very clear. One of the things that I disagree about with the RJC, with the World Diamond Council, is no one is left behind. I say a lot of people should be left behind. And we should have a leadership and we should have an industry that can provide socially responsible products to our customers. And if some people don't want to provide socially responsible, they want to do it differently, God bless them. Let them go and have a Martin, nice yeah. what would have happened if the RGC was not built in 2005? Was that Let's what? What if there would have not been an RGC in 2005? So I think you, we always have to look at the evol evolution of an industry. Yeah, I agree. But today we are you. we are in a different we are in a different we're at the crossroads. Yes. We are at the crossroads. And at the crossroads it means but not just for our industry. I think every industry is looking at, you know, where how, how am I yeah. going to head forward? Because the consumer is more conscious, because this consumer, this millennials, this Gen Z are asking more questions. Regulations, you know, it's interesting regulations have never accelerated the past five years. Even at the EU level, never, never there has been such a strong advancement of regulations, the green claims, the directory on reporting, the ESG, it's moving quickly. And the issue is, if we don't bring the industry into that space, people will be left behind. So again, it's a duty to educate and to push. And it means is you'll have leaders and followers, and that's fine, yeah. as long as we all progress. And I don't disagree with you. I don't think anybody disagrees with And the consumer, with Martin, you. the consumer has a choice, no? To yeah. buy right or not to buy right. That's right. Uh, no one disagrees. I think we all agree with what you're saying. And now the question is, where does the rubber meet the road? The, at first, you know, many years ago, I stuck to, I must have been 20 years ago with Stephen Lucia, and he said, oh, you're 10 years too early, Rappaport. We were talking about social responsibility, fair trade, diamonds. Now we may start to become 10 years too late. The man has gotten ahead of us. The consumer wants things more than what we can provide. And I would not be afraid to say to you that the very concept of the diamond, now that we're a little bit shook up by this synthetic story, it's being questioned. It's honestly being questioned. And we, we've been living on momentum of all those years of marketing, maybe, but mar it's more than marketing. There's a real need for your partner, man, woman, man and man, woman and woman, whatever, for your partner to get something that is a gift of commitment that is valuable and that need, whether it's Botswana and cows, it's Chinese jade, or it's, it's pearls in, in Japan, I'm going back here in centuries, um, it's there. So we need to now almost get ourselves up to our consumers. I think our customers are ahead of us, is what I'm thinking about. And so now that we're doing it, so we need to put something on the road. And I think we're going to start pushing forward because, yeah, in the 2006, you're saying the RJC started. 2005. Yeah, but now it's how many years later? 16 years later? You can wait another 16 years? You won't have customers for that. No, but I'm not arguing with that. No, I mean, no, no, but I think it's important because it's a sustainability platform. I think it is important. You know, it's always say, my grandma always says, it's very easy to sit on the side and criticize. And I cannot always agree with everything, also with the Responsible Jury Council, but I have deeply respect of what was built. Because if we, if we would have not had it, we would have really had no system and no standard. And we have a very, it's a very robust standard, and I agree with you. It can be challenging for small enterprises, so we'll have to find a way to bridge. So I think it's key that what we've built, we should build on, but it's not enough. And there I also agree, we need to accelerate now. And we need to become more transparent. That's yeah. it. I want to read a question here from someone who's coming in online. Should the consumer expect to pay for additional certifications for example, including an origin report within a certificate, 
The consumer may expect or even demand that it is our social and ethical response to the original information is built in as standard into certifications, regardless if we are adding value. So the question here is, again, back to this question of capturing value, and who is going to pay for this? Obviously, at some stage, the buyer, the consumer. But you know, what are the costs like? What are the profits like? So, I, you know, you're mentioning that the brands recognize they have big brands and they're at risk if they're they're doing, not doing things correctly. So they might take a very, they may spend more money, and they might not even tell the consumer this is a green diamond or something because obviously everything we sell is green. I understand that. But how about the the guys you guys deal with? You know. Do they, like the GIA issues the DOI, I don't think they charge more, okay? Um, but where do you think this can go? How do we deal with this in the real world? They pay more at the end of the day for which certificate you get. Mm -hmm. At the grocery store, they're paying more for organic versus not. For anything that has anything, you know, that's, that's more special or more whatever you want to call socially responsible or anything that has anything grand to it, they will pay more. It's just, it's, again, it goes back to marketing. And it also has to be in your mindset. It has to be. You know, it I'd love to, to shop fun. organic all the time. If, in my you have head. to market it. You have to market it without going, I think the greatest challenge is to market it without going to greenwashing. Well, we, that's, and you've got the lab girl that we're dealing with. So that's I've, the greenwashing. And then that's the, you know, that we're ethically more cleaner. We're this, we're that. And then you, I don't want to buy your, your natural diamond. And then also now I'm adding on a whole nother thing of, well, and we're, you know, responsibly sourced. And so, I mean, there's just so many levels that I think that a small <coughs> jeweler is, there's so many yeah, pieces to this puzzle. But I think at the end of the day, they would. They would what? Pay more. Yeah. It would be more. The customers will pay more. Yeah. Well, if you can get more, it's an added value proposition. It's like whether you have a J certificate. David, what do you think about this? I know you're building a whole business on the retailer being able to have this interaction and this relationship with the consumer and show them and tell them more. And by the way, to you, Josh, if you have any more questions, shoot them on here. Well, well you mentioned earlier the, the Beers uh, report that uh, went and asked consumers, uh, would they pay more? Um, and this is not because of marketing, because it hasn't yet been marketed. Uh, and they say, yes, we will pay more, whatever, 10, 15, it doesn't ma really matter. Whether the retailer should charge more, I don't know. That's up to the retailer, it's up to the brand, it's up to what, is it part of their brand promise? Is it an added value? I don't know. But in the end, if the retailer has value, they will pay more, and they're saying that they will pay more. And again, without creating some uh, artificial marketing uh, statements, retailer says, yes, this is valuable to me, uh, and therefore, yes, I, I value that, and therefore, I will pay more. How much do you think it's going to cost? No, How much I does think it it's, cost? A, it's a silence marketing. Even if you're not saying that you're broadcasting it, if you're having Cartier, if you're having Chanel, if you're having all these brands that are saying, I'm only going to source these, or I'm only going to buy these, you're look, that's already a, a, a silent market. It's your marketing. It's, it's already there for the consumers to see that this is special. So if, they're going to end up wanting to be like them. Who doesn't want to be like that? I mean, that's what all we're seeing on the red carpet. So, yeah, but, but I don't think, if you take the brands, for example, the brands are not doing this because they want to charge more. They're doing it because of that brand promise to their customer. Uh, so it's not because they can charge another X premium, uh, so they want to know where their origin is. No, and, but for, for the consumer that is looking up to the brand, you know, we're, the, they are, they're who we're looking up to. So. That's already a silent marketing, in a sense. Am I wrong? I don't know. Yeah, who, you guys have anything? I think it's so, in, like, your perspective, you know, Brilliant Earth was built on their social responsibility or on responsible business, right? And then, but, and you started how long ago? 2005. Right, and the whole industry is still not saying like, wow, look at what they're doing. We could follow in their footsteps. No, they're busy saying, what are, why are aren't you, you doing right? Yeah. Like that's. Oh. They're busy criticizing right. and busy saying, why are you Whereas selling you, lab? You are the and, example. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's just a good example of, of who is interested. There's quite clearly a market with our business of, that mm -hmm. consumers are interested in traceable diamonds um, with a brand that continues to push the envelope on trying to make 
the diamond industry in general more sustainable and compassionate. Mm -hmm. right. Tra Trace. Yeah, why don't you guys come up here and ask some questions as well? Excuse me, I'm just going to step out for a minute as well. You know, we enjoy um, products like the Microsoft Suite. I'm just going to give you an analogy here. And the core of enabling that product was DOS, which was an operating system. Standards and technologies aside, unless we treat transparency as a core operating principle, mm -hmm. then we will be forever pointing at each other about which standards to follow. Right. So even our Microsoft products today and the evolution of GPT and what is happening in the world of AI, this DOS still exists. It's the core operating principle that underpins now so many other products that are built on top of it. Now, we talk about traceability. Traceability is really like one of the pieces of the wiring that sits behind the facade of the building that enables us to turn on and off a light switch. And the industry is evolving, not just turning on and off a light. Transparency won't happen overnight. We're in a dimmer switch moment where we're just trying to illuminate. Unless there is an investment in time and effort, the green tick is worthless unless someone has done the work. And therein lies the challenge of industry. Now, there are many companies that have done the work. Sarin on Diamond Journey, Tracer, De Beers, Everledger. There are many initiatives that have chosen different disciplines of technology, but have chosen to do the work. We are still at risk today as an industry of being completely siloed in our data. The journey with Sarin is principally built on Sarin's technology and Sarin's proprietary approach with that in the market. But if we are going to bring transparency as a core operating principle of industry, then we are able to transform. And traceability will become one of the rails upon which more can be built. Questions are going to come around carbon. Questions are coming around climate, around impact, around give back systems. Um, and yet, we've spent a considerable amount of money in industry on pricing and marketing. Well, what if we took provenance, and I'm not just talking about provenance for the sake of knowing the country of origin or the mine of origin, but data provenance as well, which is the next big question. If you, if Sarin and Everledger shared data together, there would be a trustful link because we understood the data provenance of where that claim has come from, as well as the physicality of the goods in the supply chain. So perhaps the shift in mindset is looking at not standards and who does what, but it is around bringing transparency as a base operating system, the DOS equivalent, because other products will come from that. Very well said. Uh, and I want to add something on that. When we talk about transparency, and I, I liked what you said as a point, is it's not just one component, right? We, we didn't even touch the subject of ESG, and it scares everyone out. And, and also within the initiative, we're working hard on it. I know the RGC is too. It's very key that companies will try to understand environmental data, social data, governance data, how decisions are made. And again, there's the opportunity that we have to start the journey. There are some industries are much more advanced. And there it means is it's a step-by-step -step approach. And again, that data can actually support the broader data system into that picture of how a company is functioning. Because it's, you can't just put some components of sustainability in an isolated manner. Because again, then we're greenwashing, bluewashing, call it pinkwashing, and all the other topics. And the, and, the, and the evolution of um, grading reports can and should and will combine the componentry of the next generation of transparency. Why do we have to have a separate report, an SCS, which is a separate sustainability report from the likes of a GIA grading report? There's no reason why, except that we haven't joined in data sharing well across this industry. We have distributed ledger technologies, but we're still acting in silos and separate mo molecules. And there's no technical reason why today you can't privately share and still be transparent. So you can do this. There is advanced technology that enables us. Defence forces around the world use it, you know, to enable that secret sharing of information and trustful information. So it is when we start to say transparency becomes 
the core operating principle with the arterial blood flow of industry, then things change. Transparency in pricing. Let's go there, right? Imagine all of these things that we apply transparency to. That could Excellent. Be. Let's hear some of the community here. More questions? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think that uh, it sh we should get more concrete because um, I've been seeing from 2019 like a shift to a big emphasis on the country of uh, mining and the uh, origin of the stone and very good traceability being provided by the, the different DTC side holders <clears throat> that I work with. Um, they have gone beyond what they're showing on RapNet on their own websites and they have uh, shown you uh, all the documents, including the Kimberley certificates, including a photograph of the batch of rough or the individual rough that uh, the actual diamond has been cut from. And now we are talking about, uh, or you're talking here about the technology as, as you said, the technology is here, and we, I, I could have witnessed since 2019, up till the war in Ukraine, uh, that this was possible, and all this data was available. I had on my own website via an API link to several DTC site holders, country of origin on the majority of the GIA graded stones above, I think, 60, 70 points. And you know what happened? It took like 10 days and they all stopped providing this information in March 2022. <laughs> so uh, now we are talking about technology and I think there is a lot of talk about how to do that, demand of customers, but you have the power to, um, I mean, to, to make them provide this we information. Can, we can create an enabling environment for a more socially responsible marketplace. Agreed, agreed. But you have to recognize that ultimately everything depends on the willingness to pay. When people are willing to pay more for information, for transparency, then this thing's gonna fly. It's, gonna, it's not gonna go, it's not gonna be normal. It'll fly like triple X's flu in the cut. And so what we need to do is now, we need to make, give something to the community and say, like, that's what the Green Star is. And no hands doesn't like it, maybe, but I know 100% that this diamond came from Okavango, without any question, based on the scientific scanning of the rough diamond and the GA technology. Now, I can't say that about the, the information that is given to me by a manufacturer about his own goods until we can come up with CISERIN systems, other systems that actually can validate or verify the statement, the documentation that a person might make. And that's the scare that I have. We, we would have said, hey, let's just go with Tracer, let's just go with CISERIN some of them without understanding them, and then we could put something on and say, you're greenwashing, and then everything goes really backwards. So you're right, and I think we need to move in that direction. So I support what you're saying. Um, I think the world around us is going to bifurcate, if le at least bifurcate, with the Russian goods versus the other goods, with the Chinese demand versus the U.S. demand. It'll become more interesting, and there'll be more needs for knowledgeable manufacturers and retailers and distributors to assure their customer that they're getting what they expect, honestly. And even the Federal Trade Commission now looking at this whole question of claims about sustainability, and even the phrase now, sustainability in the world has become some kind of, it's almost as bad as conflict on this. But the, the point though is that you're right, and we will make steps to move forward, but we have to be honest. Transparency is only as important as long as it's honest transparency. And this is where we are today suffering. I call it greenwashing, call it pinkwashing, call it whatever washing. We have laid a foundation of the Kimberley process that everybody believes solved, cured cancer, if you ask them. Now we're putting on this RJC level on top of it. Still not enough, okay? And then we need to get, to, I think, to some hallmarking. But, you know, I'm not disagreeing with your point. Um, and the external environment, we are in the middle of a beginning, I see, at the middle of a global, I would call it an economic world war. 
Don't make any mistake about that. This is not little cutesy pie stuff with just the Ukraine. Okay, and we are seeing our entire globalization deglobalizing and bifurcating and separating. So how we sell diamonds coming from all these countries and what we say to our customers has to be honest. And to me, that's more important than transparency because I won't, <laughs> what can I do? If I'm gonna lie to people, never lie. So, but if we can come up with those systems like David is doing with Sarin, and that you've been doing also uh, the blockchain, and, and, that, and that Iris is pushing. I, I'm very optimistic. I mean, we're coming to an end of this, but I'm optimistic because I think all of us realize that the, the train has left the station. But Martin, yeah. trans stability and transparency doesn't have to become a burden on the consumer. Agreed, agreed. We, it can be a zero-sum game. We are tragically unorganized as an industry and we have a Russian doll of cost when it comes to compliance. And arguably that compliance, we have no operating system for compliance across industry because everyone is asking different questions yeah, based that's on the what we're trying to achieve. That's, so, that's so how you cook the chicken soup. It I mean, can it, become a really, zero sum game yeah. if there is some enablement around data sharing and data protocols, yeah. which we don't do well as an industry. But, but I think it's coming. Look, we're sitting on probably more data than anyone else in this industry. Correct. And we're willing to share information and put on information and to list information, and whether it's Serin or whether it's Tracer or whether it's anything. Um, so I think that we will take the position of being totally transparent about information, and especially if anybody that wants to say anything about information as long as they're honest. Um, our biggest concern, I say to you, is the greenwashing environment that's already been laid out so thick on the diamond industry. And now to make sure that what we say is honest truth. That's but no right. one's doing the work. No one's doing the work. What do you mean? What kind we of have, work? Let's say lab grown as an example. Yeah, everyone has chosen the color green for whatever reason. But where's the LCAs? Our last LCA that has been done is decades ago around, around lab grown. It's a scientific yeah. Yeah. baseline of truth around carbon and sequestration yeah, yeah, rates. Yeah, but, but no, the, the ND, whatever, the National Diamond Council, whatever, they put out a report a few weeks ago. But again, can we it's provide not an a, a secure product to our customer? Forget about yeah. everything else. Yeah, go but, ahead. but yeah, Martin, just to, to go on top of that, regulations are already there. Eh? I mean, look at the green cl claims now from Europe. You, okay, United States is doing the same. So we, you can't just go out there and claim yeah, something. I agree. So, so that's the good news. And you're right. We need to also learn when we say something to believe in science. Eh? And maybe that's something that I've learned working 10 months now with the brands, which I actually love. I had no clue about biodiversity. I think I know a little bit about climate and I'm learning based on facts and figures and data and proof points. So I think one thing, one point we haven't discussed yet, which is very close to my heart, is the people working in this industry. 70, 80% are small enterprises, family businesses. They will bring the business to the next generation. How are we going to attract youngsters, talented people all over the world to continue to work for our industry? We need to be attractive because they have choices and the war for talent is on. And that's not based on my mind, it's based on data from the World Economic Forum, Harvard, you name it. So how are we going to protect that too? Eh? Mm -hmm. People willing to work in manufacturing, people willing to polish diamonds, you know, designers. And now we can even talk about diversity and inclusion, gender. Excuse me, where are we there? Yeah. Well, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. You've done seven. well on this panel, yeah. Martin. <laughs> I know, I, I, but, but your, first of all, your point about education is very true, and I think that when we look at the added value of being socially responsible, it's not just to our customers, it's to ourselves, to our employees, to our children, mm -hmm. that we are living an ethical life. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that needs to be marketed and, and, and promoted. But the industry, I, I, with all due respect to the idealism of the Gen Zs, and I love them and they're great, and, we do need to provide that. I find that they're also interested in money. And they're interested in, in we don't want to live to work. We want to work to live, which is healthy, which is good. I'm not against, you know, whatever they call it, quiet quitting and stuff. I accept that. So we need to recognize our society uh, as a great thing from an employee standpoint, as well as, you know, I don't know if our employees are more important than our customers, to tell you the mm -hmm. honest truth. 
Okay? And so this idea of moving forward the social responsibility in the industry is equally important internally to our employees, to our team members. You gotta believe you're doing something good with your life. Mm -hmm. Okay? And so I think that we need to balance this out. But again, my experience shows me that if you can drive economic incentivization for social responsibility, you'll get it. And that society will get the level of social responsibility they're willing to pay for, no more and no less. So what we need to do is do the marketing, think carefully about how we can add value to our products, be it loose diamonds, jewelry, gems, whatever, mm -hmm. by being socially responsible. And also to take your point, it's not just about the source. Exactly. It's also about, you know, like we print the magazine, we make sure we're using recycled paper. And you know, all the different things that we can do. I would love to see a greater involvement of the brands together with the smaller retailers. And well, um, Martin, I mean, allow me to say, because, you know, the Watch and Joy Initiative was founded a year ago uh, with oh, many leading brands. But if you look at it, and I'm really happy, in July we'll be with 50, many different uh, smaller suppliers are joining in, which is great because they want to learn, they want to accelerate. And I think that will be the testing. I think it will be challenging because these topics are difficult. So we need to, I think I will be, I will deliver on my mission with my board and my members if I can get everyone to, to, to move. I think I'm very optimistic. Okay, allow me to say 32 years in the industry. I've worked 32 years in the industry. When I arrived, Martin, there was Chaim Evan Zohar who did a conference in Antwerp. And I asked if sustainability could be part of that conference. And that was already a big, uh, how would I call it, uh, discussion. Finally, I got on the plan at the end of the day in a small room in Antwerp, and nearly no one came. Eh? And at the end of the day, he made a speech and said, let's give Iris a warm hearted applaud because almost poor women, right? Nobody's really interested in a topic. It was the case, it was the case. Nobody was really interested in a topic. Over time, we've seen it moved. Acknowledge the mining houses. I was there with the beers, best practice principles. It changed the way the site holders did their business. Responsible Jewelry Council, Royal Diamond Council. Everyone needs to now accelerate. That's my message. And we need to work together for a unified voice to the industry. And we need to bring the small enterprises along. And to your point, Alicia, and I think definitely also with Brilliant Earth, I think that's a shared responsibility. We need to share more information. We're all reinventing the wheel, like life cycle analysis on products. Why aren't we sharing that data research? That's where we need to work together. And I'll be quiet. <laughs> no, that's a great note. It's, first of all, I don't think I, we all agree. Yeah, we do. Oh, we all wow. agree. So we all agree with Iris, okay? And I think that there is consensus of where we need to go. We're not sure how to get there, but at least we know where we're going. And I, you know, on that note of we need to accelerate, um, I think that is the right note for this conference to kind of conclude with. I think we have a lot of work to do to bring maybe the big brands, the smaller retailers together. I think we have a lot of work to do with the way in which we can show that the polished diamond comes from this rough diamond, and that it was cut in a certain factory that is applying RJC principles, maybe as the base law. But then we need to go beyond principles to standards. And so I look forward very much to seeing great accomplishments from every, everybody. And uh, I thank you all for spending your time with us today. <laughs>